Oh, I got to get somebody out to clean that off. Mm -hmm. Chapter 21. The attack. As soon as Silver disappeared, the captain, who had been closely watching him, turned towards the interior of the house and found not a man of us at his post but Gray. It was the first time we had ever seen him angry. Quarters! he roared. And then, as we all slunk back to our places, Gray! he said. I'll put your name in the lock. You've stood by your duty like a seaman. Mr. Trelawney, I'm surprised at you, sir. Doctor, I thought you had worn the king's coat. If that was how you served at Fontenoy, sir, you would have been better in your berth. The doctor's watch were all back at their loopholes. The rest were busy loading the spare muskets, and everyone with a red face, you may be certain, and a flea in his ear, as the saying is. The captain looked on for a while in silence, then he spoke. My lads, said he, I've given Silver a broadside. I pitched it in red hot on purpose, and before the hour's out, as he said, we shall be boarded. We're outnumbered, I needn't tell you that, but... We fight in shelter, and a minute ago, I should have said we fought with discipline. I have no manner of doubt that we can drub them, if you choose. Then he went the rounds and saw, as he said, that all was clear. On the two short sides of the house, east and west, there were only two loopholes. On the south side, where the porch was, two again, and on the north side, five. There was a round score of muskets for the seven of us. The firewood had been built into four piles, tables, you might say, one about the middle of each side, and on each of these tables some ammunition and four loaded muskets were laid ready to the hand of the defenders. In the middle, the cutlass lay ranged. Toss out the fire, said the captain. The chill is past, and we mustn't have smoke in our eyes. The iron fire basket was carried bodily out by Mr. Trelawney, and the embers smothered among sand. Hawkins hasn't had his breakfast. Hawkins, help yourself, and back to your post to eat it, continued Captain Smollett. Lively now, my lad. You'll want it before you've, you've done. Hunter, serve out a round of brandy to all hands. And while this was going on, the captain completed, in his own mind, the plan of the defense. Doctor, you will take the door, he resumed. See, and don't expose yourself. Keep within and fire through the porch. Hunter, take the east side. There. Joyce, you stand by the west, my man. Mr. Trelawney, you are the best shot. You and Mr. Gray will take this long north side with the five loopholes. It's there the danger is. If they can get up to it and fire in upon us through our own ports, things would begin to look dirty. Hawkins, neither you nor I are much account at the shooting. We'll stand by to load and bear a hand. As the captain had said, the chill was past. As soon as the sun had climbed above our girdle of trees, it fell with all its force upon the clearing and drank up the vapors at a drop. Soon the sand was baking and the resin melting in the logs of the blockhouse. Jackets and coats were flung aside, shirts thrown open at the neck and rolled up at the shoulder, and we stood there, each at his post, in a fever of heat and anxiety. An hour passed away. Hang them, said the captain. This is as dull as the doldrums. Gray whistle for a wind. And just at that moment came the first news of the attack. If you please, sir, said Joyce, if I see anyone, am I to fire? I told you so, cried the captain. Thank you, sir, returned Joyce with the same quiet civility. Nothing followed for a time, but the remark had set us all on the alert, straining ears and eyes. The musketeers with their pieces balanced in their hands, the captain 
out in the middle of the blockhouse with his mouth very tight and a frown on his face. So some seconds passed, till suddenly Joyce whipped up his musket and fired. The report had scarcely died away ere it was repeated and repeated from without in a scattering volley, shot behind shot like a string of geese from every side of the enclosure. Several bullets struck the log house, but not one entered. And as the smoke cleared away and vanished, the stockade and the woods around it looked as quiet and empty as before. Not a bow waved, not the gleam of a musket barrel betrayed the presence of our foes. Did you hit your man? asked the captain. No, sir, replied Joyce. I believe not, sir. Next best thing to tell the truth, muttered Captain Smollett. Load his gun, Hawkins. How many should say there were on your side, doctor? I know precisely, said Dr. Lindsay. Three shots were fired on this side. I saw the three flashes, two close together, one farther to the west. Three, repeated the captain. And how many on yours, Mr. Trelawney? But this was not so easily answered. There had come many from the north, seven by the squire's computation, eight or nine, according to Gray. From the east and west, only a single shot had been fired. It was plain, therefore, that the attack would be developed from the north and that on the other three sides, we were only to be annoyed by a show of hostilities. But Captain Smollett made no change in his arrangements. If the mutineers succeeded in crossing the stockade, he argued, they would take possession of any unprotected loophole and shoot us down like rats in our own stronghold. Nor had we much time left to us for thought. Suddenly, with a loud huzza, a little cloud of pirates leaped from the woods on the north side and ran straight on the stockade. At the same moment, the fire was once more opened from the woods, and a rifle ball sang through the doorway and knocked the doctor's musket into bits. The boarders swarmed over the fence like monkeys. Squire and Gray fired again, and yet again. Three men fell, one forwards into the enclosure, two back on the outside. But of these, one was evidently more frightened than hurt, for he was on his feet again in a crack and instantly disappeared among the trees. Two had bit the dust, one had fled. Four had made good their footing inside our defenses, while from the shelter of the woods, seven or eight men each evidently supplied with several muskets, kept up a hot, though useless, fire on the log house. The four who had boarded made straight before them for the building, shooting, shouting as they ran, and the men among the trees shouted back to encourage them. Several shots were fired, but such was the hurry of the marksmen that not one appears to have taken effect. In a moment, the four pirates had swarmed up the mound and were upon us. The head of Job Anderson, the boatswain, appeared at the middle loophole. <clears throat> Adam, all hands, all hands, he roared in a voice of thunder. At the same moment, another pirate grasped Hunter's musket by the muzzle, wrenched it from his hands, plucked it through the loophole, and with one stunning blow, laid the poor fellow senseless on the floor. Meanwhile, a third, running unharmed all around the house, appeared suddenly in the doorway and fell with his cutlass on the doctor. Our position was utterly reversed. A moment since we were firing under cover at an exposed enemy, now it was we who lay uncovered and could not return a blow. The log house was full of smoke, to which we owed our comparative safety. Cries and confusion, the flashes and reports of pistol shots, and one loud groan rang in my ears. Out, lads, out, and fight them in the open. Cutlasses, cried the captain. I snatched a cutlass from the pile, and someone, at the same time snatching another, gave me a cut across the knuckles, which I hardly felt. I dashed out of the door into the clear sunlight. 
Someone was close behind, I knew not who. Right in front, the doctor was pursuing his assailant down the hill, and just as my eyes fell upon him, beat down his guard and sent him sprawling on his back with a great slash across the face. Round the house, lads, round the house, cried the captain. And even in the hurly-burly, I perceived a change in his voice. Mechanically, I obeyed, turned eastwards, and with my cutlass raised, ran round the corner of the house. Next moment, I was face to face with Anderson. He roared aloud, and his hanger went up above his head, flashing in the sunlight. I had not time to be afraid but as the blow still hung impending, leaped in a trice upon one side, and missing my foot in the soft sand, rolled headlong down the slope. When I had first sallied from the door, the other mutineers had been already swarming up the palisade to make an end of us. One man, in a red nightcap, with his cutlass in his mouth, had even got upon the top and thrown a leg across. Well, so short had been the interval, that when I found my feet again, all was in the same posture. The fellow with the red nightcap still halfway over, another still just showing his head above the top of the stockade. And yet, in this breath of time, the fight was over, and the victory was ours. Gray, following close behind me, had cut down the big boatswain ere he had time to recover from his last blow. Another had been shot at a loophole in the very act of firing into the house, and now lay in agony, the pistol still smoking in his hand. A third, as I had seen, the doctor had disposed of at a blow. Of the four who had scaled the palisade, one only remained unaccounted for, and he, having left his cutlass on the field, was now clambering out again with the fear of death upon him. <clears throat> Fire! Fire from the house, cried the doctor, and you lads, back in the cover. But his words were unheeded. No shot was fired, and the last boarder made good his escape and disappeared with the rest into the wood. In three seconds, nothing remained of the attacking party but the five who had fallen, four on the inside and one on the outside of the palisade. The doctor, Ray, and I ran full speed for shelter. Their survivors would soon be back where they had left their muskets, and at any moment the fire might recommence. The house was by this time somewhat cleared of smoke, and we saw at a glance the price we had paid for victory. Hunter lay beside his loophole, stunned. Joyce, by his, shot through the head, never to move again. While right in the center, the squire was supporting the captain, one as pale as the other. The captain's wounded, said Mr. Trelawney. Have they run? asked Mr. Smollett. All that could, you may be bound, returned the doctor, but there's five of them will never run again. Five, cried the captain. Come, that's better. Five against three leaves us four to nine. That's better odds than we had at starting. We were seven to nineteen men, or thought we were. That's as bad to bear. The mutineers were soon only eight in number, for the man shot by Mr. Trelawney on board the schooner died that same evening of his wound. But this was, of course, not known till after by the faithful party. <clears throat> Part five, my sea adventure. How, chapter 22, How I Began My Sea Adventure. There was no return of the mutineers, not so much as another shot out of the woods. They had got their rations for that day, as the captain put it, and we had the place to ourselves and a quiet time to overhaul the wounded and get dinner. Squire and I cooked outside in spite of the danger, and even outside we could hardly tell 
what we were at, for horror of the loud groans that reached us from the doctor's patients. Out of the eight men who had fallen in the action, only three still breathed. That one of the pirates who had been shot at the loophole, Hunter and Captain Smollett, and of these, the first two were as good as dead. The mutineer indeed died under the doctor's knife, and Hunter, do what we could, never recovered consciousness in this world. He lingered all day, breathing loudly, like the old buccaneer at home in his apoplectic pit. But the booms of his chest had been crushed by the blow, and his skull fractured in fall. And some time in the following night, without sign or sound, he went to his maker. As for the captain, his wounds were grievous indeed, but not dangerous. No organ was fatally injured. Anderson's ball, for it was Job that shot him first, had broken his shoulder blade and touched the lung, not badly. The second had only torn and displaced some muscles in the calf. He was sure to recover, the doctor said, but in the meantime, and for weeks to come, he must not walk nor move his arm, nor so much as speak when he could help it. My own accidental cut across the knuckles was a flea bite. Dr. Livesey patched it up with plaster and pulled my ears for me into the bargain. After dinner, the squire and the doctor sat by the captain's side while in consultation. And when they had talked to their heart's content, it being then a little past noon, the doctor took up his hat and pistols, girt on cutlass, put the chart in his pocket, and with a musket over his shoulder, crossed the palisade on the north side and set off briskly through the trees. Gray and I were sitting together at the far end of the blockhouse to be out of earshot of our officers consulted and Gray took his pipe out of his mouth and fairly forgot to put it back again, so thunderstruck he was at this occurrence. Why, in the name of Davy Jones, said he, is Dr. Livesey mad? Why, no, says I. He's about the last of this crew for that, I take it. Well, shipmate, said Gray, but he may not be, but if he's not, you mark my words, I am. I take it, replied I. The doctor has his idea, and if I am right, he's going now to see Ben Gunn. I was right, as appeared later, but in the meantime, the house being stifling, hot in the little patch of sand inside the palisade ablaze with midday sun, I began to get another thought into my head, which was not by any means so right. What I began to do was to envy the doctor walking in the cool shadow of the woods with the birds about him and the pleasant smell of the pines while I sat grilling with my clothes stuck to the hot resin and so much blood about me and so many poor dead bodies lying all around that I took a disgust of the place that was almost as strong as fear. All the time I was washing out the blockhouse and then washing up the things from dinner this disgust and envy kept growing stronger and stronger, till at last being near a bread bag, and no one then observing me, I took the first step towards my es escapade and filled both pockets of my coat with biscuit. I was a fool, if you like, and certainly I was going to do a foolish, overbold act, but I was determined to do it with all the precautions in my power. These biscuits, should anything befall me, would keep me at least from starving till far on in the next day. The next thing I laid hold of was a brace of pistols. And as I already had a powder horn and bullets, I felt myself well supplied with arms. As for the scheme I had in my head, it was not a bad one in itself. I was to go down the sandy spit that divides the anchorage on the east from the open sea, find the white rock I had observed last evening, and ascertain whether it was there or not that Ben Gunn had hidden his boat, a thing quite worth doing, as I still believe. But as I was certain I should 
not be allowed to leave the enclosure. My only plan was to take French leave and slip out when nobody was watching, and that was so bad a way of doing it as made the thing itself wrong. But I was only a boy, and I had made up my mind. Well, as things at last fell out, I found an admirable opportunity. The squire and Gray were busy helping the captain with his bandages. The coast was clear. I made a bolt for it over the stockade and into the thickest of the trees, and before my absence was observed, I was out of cry of my companions. This was my second folly, far worse than the first, as I left but two sound men to guard the house, but like the first, it was a help towards saving all of us. I took my way straight for the east coast of the island, for I was determined to go down the seaside of the spit to avoid all chance of observation from the anchorage. It was already late in the afternoon, although still warm and sunny. As I continued to thread the tall woods, I could hear from far before me not only the continuous thunder of the surf, but a certain tossing of the foliage and grinding of boughs, which showed me the sea breeze had set in higher than usual. Soon, cool drops of air began to reach me, and a few steps farther, I came forth into the open borders of the grove. I saw the sea lying blue and sunny to the horizon, and the surf tumbling, tossing its foam along the beach. I have never seen the sea quiet round Treasure Island. The sun might blaze overhead, the air be without a breeze, the surface smooth and blue, but still, these great rollers would be running along all the external coast, thundering and thundering by day and night. And I scarce believe there is one spot in the island where a man would be out of earshot of their noise. I walked along beside the surf with great enjoyment, till, thinking I was now got far enough to the south, I took the cover of some thick bushes and crept warily up to the ridge of the spit. Behind me was the sea, in front the anchorage. The sea breeze, as though it had the sooner blown itself out by its unusual violence, was already at an end. It had been succeeded by light, variable airs from the south and southeast, carrying great banks of fog, and the anchorage, under lee of Skeleton Island, lay still and leaded as when first we entered it. The Spaniola, in that unbroken mirror, was exactly portrayed from the truck to the waterline, the Jolly Roger hanging on the peak. Alongside lay one of the gigs, silver in the stern sheets, him I could always recognize, while a couple of men were leaning over the stern bulwarks, one of them with a red cap, the very rogue that I had seen some hours before stride legs upon the palisade. Apparently, they were talking and laughing, though at that distance, upwards of a mile, I could, of course, hear no word of what was said. All at once there began the most horrid, unearthly screaming, which at first startled me badly, though I had soon remembered the voice of Captain Flint, and even thought I could make out the bird by her bright plumage as she sat perched upon her master's wrist. Soon after, the jolly boat shoved off and pulled for shore, and the man with the red cap and his comrade went below by the cabin companion. Just about the same time, the sun had gone down behind the spyglass, and as the fog was collecting rapidly, it began to grow dark in earnest. I saw I must lose no time if I were to find the boat that evening. The white rock, visible enough above the brush, was still some eight up a mile further down the spit, and it took me a goodish while to get up with it, crawling off on all fours among the scrub. Night had almost come when I laid my hand on its rough side. Right below it, there was an exceedingly small hollow of green turf, hidden by banks and a thick underwood about knee-deep that grew there very plentifully. And in the center of the dell, sure enough, a little tint of goat skins, like what the gypsies carried about with them in England. I dropped into the hollow, 
lifted the side of the tent, and there was Ben Gunn's boat. Homemade, if ever anything was homemade. A rude lopsided framework of tough wood and stretched upon that a covering of goatskin with the hair inside. The thing was extremely small, even for me, and I can hardly imagine that it could have floated with a full-sized man. There was one thwart set as low as possible, a kind of stretcher in the bows, and a double paddle for propulsion. I had not then seen a coral, such as the ancient Britons made, but I have seen one since, and I can give you no fairer idea of Ben Gunn's boat than by saying it was like the first and the worst coracle ever made by man. But the great advantage of the coracle it certainly possessed, for it was exceedingly light and portable. Well, now that I had found the boat, you would have thought I had enough of truantry for once. But in the meantime, I had taken another notion and become so obstinately fond of it that I would have carried it out, I believe, in the teeth of Captain Smollett himself. This was to slip out under cover of the night, cut the Hispaniola adrift, and let her go ashore where she fancied. I had quite made up my mind that the mutineers, after their repulse of the morning, had nothing nearer their hearts than to up anchor and away to sea. This, I thought, it would be a fine thing to prevent. Now that I had seen how they left their watchmen unprovided with a boat, I thought it might be done with little risk. Down I sat to wait for darkness and made a hearty meal of biscuit. It was a night out of 10,000 for my purpose. The fog had now buried all heaven as the last rays of daylight dwindled and disappeared. Absolute blackness settled down on Treasure Island. And when at last I shouldered the coracle and groped my way stumblingly out of the hollow where I had supped, there were but two points visible on the whole anchorage. One was the great fire on shore by which the defeated pirates lay carousing in the swamp. The other, a mere blur of light upon the darkness, indicated the position of the anchored ship. She had swung round to the ebb, her bow now towards me. The only lights on board were in the cabin. What I saw was merely a reflection on the fog of the strong rays that flowed from the stern window. The ebb had already run some time. I had to wade through a long belt of swampy sand where I sank several times above the ankle before I came to the edge of the retreating water. And wading a little way in with some strength and dexterity set my coracle keel downwards on the surface. Chapter 23. The ebb tide run. The coracle, as I had ample reason to know before I was done with her, was a very safe boat for a person of my height and weight, both buoyant and clever in a seaway. But she was the most cross grained, lopsided craft to manage. Do as you please, she always made more leeway than anything else, and turning round and round was the maneuver she was best at. Even Ben Gunn himself has admitted that she was queer to handle till you know her away. Certainly, I did not know her way. She turned in every direction but the one I was bound to go. The most part of the time we were broadside on, and I am very sure I never should have made the ship at all but for the tide. By good fortune, paddle as I pleased, the tide was still sweeping me down, and there lay the Hispaniola right in the fairway, hardly to be missed. First, she loomed before me like a blot of something yet blacker than darkness. Then her spars and hull began to take shape, and the next moment, 
as it seemed, for the farther I went. The, br the brisker grew the current of the ebb. I was alongside her hawser and had laid hold. The hawser was as taut as a bowstring, and the current so strong she pulled upon her anchor. All round the hull, in the blackness, the rippling current bubbled, chattered like a mountain stream. One cut with my sea gully, and the Hispaniola would go humming down the tide. So far, so good. But it next occurred to my recollection that a top hawser suddenly cut is a thing as dangerous as a kicking horse. Ten to one, if I were so foolhardy as to cut the Hispaniola from her anchor, I and the coracle would be knocked clean out of the water. This brought me to a full stop, and if fortune had not again particularly favored me, I should have I should have had to abandon my design. But the light airs which had begun blowing from the southeast and south had hauled round after nightfall into the southwest. Just while I was meditating, a puff came, caught the Hispaniola, and forced her up into the current, and to my great joy I felt the hawser slacken in my grasp, and the hand by which I held it dip for a second under water. With that, I made up my mind, took out my gully, opened it with my teeth, and cut one strand after another till the vessel swung only by two. Then I lay quiet, waiting to sever these last when the strain should be once more lightened by a breath of wind. All this time, I had heard the sound of loud voices from the cabin, but to say truth, my mind had been so entirely taken up with other thoughts that I had scarcely given, e given ear. Now, however, when I had nothing else to do, I began to pay more heed. One I recognized for the coxswains, Israel Hands, that had been Flint's gunner in former days. The other was, of course, my friend of the red nightcap. Both men were plainly the worse of drink, and they were still drinking, for even while I was listening, one of them, with a drunken cry, opened the stern window and threw out something, which I divined to be an empty bottle. But they were not only tipsy, it was plain that they were furiously angry. Oaths flew like hailstones, and every now and then there came forth such an explosion as I thought was sure to end in blows. But each time the quarrel passed off, and the voices grumbled lower for a while, until the next crisis came, and in its turn passed away without result. On shore, I could see the glow of the great campfire burning warmly through the shoreside trees. Someone was singing a dull, old, droning sailor song, with a droop and a quaver at the end of every verse, and seemingly no end to it at all but the patience of the singer. I had heard it on the voyage more than once and remembered these words. But one man of her crew alive, what put to sea with seventy-five? And I thought it was a ditty rather too dolefully appropriate for a company that had met such cruel losses in the morning. But indeed, from what I saw, all these buccaneers were as callous as the sea they sailed. At last the breeze came. The schooner sidled and drew nearer in the dark. I felt the hawser slacken once more, and with a good, tough effort, cut the last fibers through. The breeze had but little action on the coral, and I was almost instantly swept against the bows of the Hispaniola. At the same time, the schooner began to turn upon her heel, spinning slowly end for end across the current. I wrought like a fiend, for I expected every moment to be swamped, and since I found I could not push the coracle directly off, I now shoved straight astern. At length, I was clear of my dangerous neighbor, and just as I gave the last impulsion, my hands came across a light cord that was trailing overboard across the stern bulwarks. Instantly, I grasped it. Why I should have done so, I can hardly say. It was at first mere instinct, but once I had it in my hands, 
and found it fast, curiosity began to get the upper hand, and I determined I should have one look through the cabin window. I pulled in hand over hand on the cord, and when I judged myself near enough, rose at infinite risk to about half my height, and thus commanded the roof and a slice of the interior of the cabin. By this time, the schooner and her little consort were gliding pretty swiftly through the water. Indeed, we had already fetched up level with the campfire. The ship was talking, as sailors say, loudly treading the innumerable ripples with an incessant weltering splash, and until I got my eye above the window sill, I could not comprehend why the watchman had taken no alarm. One glance, however, was sufficient, and it was only one glance that I durst take from that unsteady skiff. It showed me hands and his companion locked together in deadly wrestle, each with a hand upon the other's throat. I dropped upon the thwart again, none too soon, for I was near overboard. I could see nothing for the moment but these two furious and crimson faces swaying together under the smoky lamp, and I shut my eyes to let them grow once more familiar with the darkness. The endless ballad had come to an end at last, and the whole diminished company about the campfire had broken into the chorus I had heard so often. Fifteen men on the dead men's chest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil had done for the rest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. I was just thinking how busy drink and the devil were at that very moment in the cabin of the Hispaniola when I was surprised by a sudden lurch of the cork. At the same moment, she yawed sharply and seemed to change her course. The speed in the meantime had strangely increased. I opened my eyes at once. All round me were little ripples, combing over with a sharp bristling sound and slightly phosphorescent. The Spaniola herself, a few yards in whose wake I was still, being whirled along, seemed to stagger in her course, and I saw her spars toss a little against the blackness of the night. Nay, as I looked longer, I made sure she also was wheeling to the southward. I glanced over my shoulder, and my heart jumped against my ribs. There, right behind me, was the glow of the campfire. The current had turned at right angles, sweeping round along with it the tall schooner and the little dancing cork, ever quickening, ever bubbling higher, ever muttering louder. It went spinning through the narrows for the open sea. Suddenly, the schooner in front of me gave a violent yaw, turning, perhaps, through twenty degrees, and almost at the same moment one shout followed another from on board. I could hear feet pounding on the companion ladder, and I knew that the two drunkards had at last been interrupted in the quarrel and awakened to a sense of their disaster. I lay down flat in the bottom of that wretched skiff and devoutly recommended my spirit to its maker. At the end of the straits, I made sure we must fall into some bar of raging breakers, where all my troubles would be ended speedily. And though I could, perhaps, bear to die, I could not bear to look upon my fate as it approached. So I must have lain for hours, continually beaten to and fro upon the billows, now and again wetted with flying sprays, and never ceasing to expect death at the next plunge. Gradually, weariness grew upon me. A numbness, an occasional stupor, fell upon my mind, even in the midst of my terrors, until sleep at last supervened, and in my sea-tossed coracle, I lay and dreamed of home and the old Admiral Binbow.